Six-year-old Logan Lynn Tucker was last seen in June 2002. When his four-year-old brother asked his mother Catherine where he had gone, she told him he went where the bad boys go. Catherine was later tried and convicted for Logan's murder, but his remains have never been recovered to this day. Logan Lynn Tucker was born April 10, 1996 to his mother Catherine. Catherine has been married multiple times and may be referred to by any ever married names, including Rutan and Pollard. Logan also had a younger brother named Justin Daggett, who was born in 1998. Catherine complained to various witnesses about her oldest son, Logan. She repeatedly stated she did not want him in her life. He was in the way and she wanted him gone. In 1999, she told a boyfriend that she wished there was a way to kill her children and get away with it. She was seen being violent with Logan on multiple occasions, had made attempts to abandon him, and was known to neglect him. After her fourth husband's home burned down, Catherine blamed Logan for it, although there was no proof or evidence to support her claim. In early 2002, she asked her parents to take Logan, but they were unable to care for him at that time. In April 2002, Catherine reached out to a crisis hotline and said she was afraid she was going to hurt her children, particularly Logan. She stated that Logan was dangerous, that he had a history of starting fires, and that she was afraid he was going to hurt Justin. Both children were taken into custody by DHS. A DHS worker interviewed Logan and thought he appeared normal, friendly, and well-mannered. The children were returned to Catherine's custody within a few days. In June 2002, Catherine and her two children moved in with a roommate by the name of Melody Lennington in Woodward, Oklahoma. Catherine again reached out to DHS for help with Logan's alleged fire-setting behavior. DHS agreed to place Logan in a psychiatric hospital for testing, but there were not any immediate openings available for him. Catherine reacted angrily when she learned it would be four days before DHS would take Logan on or around June 24th, 2002. Logan was last seen alive on June 22nd by Melody when Catherine had put the boys down for bed. In the early morning hours of June 23rd, Melody awoke to Logan screaming and crying. She went back to sleep. When she awoke again at 6 a.m. to go to work, she asked Catherine what had happened. Catherine responded that he was sick and she had him put in the basement. Later that same day, Catherine was again questioned by her roommate and her boyfriend about Logan's whereabouts. She told them DHS had taken the boy and that he would be placed with his biological father. At this time, they did not know DHS was not scheduled to pick Logan up until the following day. Catherine had a bruise on her arm, which she stated she had received from Logan when he was being picked up by DHS. In the days following, witnesses state that she appeared relieved that Logan was gone and tried giving away his belongings. Justin told one witness that Logan wouldn't be home anymore. Between June 23rd and July 7th, Logan's grandparents, Connie and Don Henson, made numerous failed attempts to contact the boy. Karen gave them evasive answers about his whereabouts before telling them that he was in a residential facility. They offered to take custody of him, but she refused to divulge the name of the facility. Connie and Don reported Logan missing to authorities on July 7th, 2002. After Logan was reported missing, authorities went to question Catherine. The story she gave police was that Logan was with her brother, Brian Marquardt. She stated that he traveled for work and that she did not have his contact information. Brian claimed that he had not seen the child in over a year and was quickly cleared as a suspect in Logan's disappearance. Catherine asked a male acquaintance to pretend to be Brian and state that he did have Logan. Authorities were able to determine that Logan was not in the care of any of Catherine's family, friends, or acquaintances. He was also not enrolled in any care facilities that Catherine claimed she had placed him in. A search of Catherine's home turned up masking tape with hairs attached and bloodstains, which DNA testing proved to be Logan's. Rope, drain cleaner, and plastic sheeting were also found in the home. Catherine had borrowed the plastic sheeting from a boyfriend, stating she wanted to plant flowers. However, no flowers were ever planted. When authorities interviewed Justin, who was four at that time, he told a chilling story about a drive out into the country with his mom and brother. He said Logan was white and didn't move, and that his mom put tape on his eyes so he wouldn't cry. He said that his mom had a shovel and plastic. Catherine removed Logan, the shovel, and the plastic from the car. She told Justin not to get out of the car because there were snakes around. She left, and when she returned to the car, she was alone. When Justin asked his mother where Logan was, she apparently said, He went to where the bad boys go, and if you ever do anything like he did, you'll end up in the same place. In September 2002, Catherine moved away from Woodward. Shortly thereafter, she was arrested on check charges and incarcerated. She never followed up on her missing son's case and refused to cooperate with the investigation into his disappearance. Nearly four years after his disappearance in February 2006, Catherine was charged with her son's murder despite the fact that his body had not been found. Her previous roommate Melody, some of her ex-boyfriends, and even her second child Justin testified against her at trial. At trial, Justin's story was slightly different. 
He said they drove to a man's house and that on that ride, Logan did not move or speak. He saw his mother carry Logan to the house, but did not see her enter because there were trees blocking his view. When leaving the house, he remembered seeing a man looking through the window. He stated he did not remember his previous interview or talking about the shovel and plastic, but remembered showing this house to social workers and investigators shortly after Logan's disappearance and referred to it as his mother's brother's house. More interesting testimony came from a sanitation worker who recalled seeing a blue suitcase wrapped in plastic and tied with a rope out for trash pickup on Catherine's block after Logan's disappearance. He reported an awful smell coming from the suitcase and that it was heavy, weighing between 40 to 60 pounds. Another witness verified seeing him place the suitcase into the garbage truck. Melody, Catherine's roommate at the time, reported a blue suitcase had gone missing about the same time. Jurors deliberated for less than two hours, and in August 2007, Catherine Rutten Pollard was convicted of the first-degree murder of Logan Tucker. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the years since, various searches have been conducted for the boy. Citizens of Woodward County even donated money to cover the expenses of a psychic to help search for Logan, but the psychic was unsuccessful. Even though someone has been held accountable for his murder, the question still remains. Where are the remains of Logan Tucker? Do you think that he was in the suitcase picked up by a sanitation worker, which was likely taken to a landfill, or do you believe he was buried in the woods, who is the man whose house they apparently drove to? Considering all the circumstances here, what do you think is the most likely? Did Catherine take him out and bury him somewhere? Or do you think that this described suitcase and the landfill was the eventual endpoint? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Blink Video Edits. What is your theory on what happened to Andrew Gosden? Andrew Gosden was a 14-year-old boy who went missing in 2007 in the United Kingdom. On that day, Andrew left his home in Doncaster after skipping school without anyone's knowledge. He withdrew 200 pounds from his bank account and bought a one-way ticket, despite a return ticket being an extra 50 pence, to London from Doncaster Station. He was last seen on CCTV leaving King's Cross Station in London upon his arrival after what is roughly a two-hour train journey. Nobody has any idea why he went to London that day and why he only bought a one-way ticket. The main theories I've heard are, he ran away. However, this doesn't make sense to me, given that he didn't take all of his money with him, his PSP charger, or, well, anything. He barely took anything with him at all. Also, it would be extremely difficult for a 14-year-old to run away from home and to never be discovered to this day. He went to a concert or other activity and was met with foul play. However, why then did he not buy a return train ticket for literally 50 pence more? This seems very, very unlikely, even if you have promised a lift home. Why wouldn't he tell or ask his parents? They were not the type to keep him from going to activities such as this. He was groomed. He didn't have any easy access to the internet, making it very difficult for him to be groomed, which generally requires hours and hours of online communication. Sony confirmed he never accessed the internet via his PSP, and he did not have a mobile phone because he didn't want one. He committed suicide. Then why would he go all the way to London? Why would he put his uniform in the washing machine for the next day? How on earth did he manage to conceal his body in a very densely populated city like London? If he committed suicide in London, I find it very hard to believe that he was so clever that he managed to do it without his body ever being found. I'm really interested to see what theories you guys have. This case just boggles my mind and has done for a very long time. I hope we one day find out what happened. So something a lot of people have suggested involving this case is some of the things that we might seem feel significant aren't actually that significant or may just be a red herring. Maybe they didn't know about the return ticket being only marginally more money. Maybe it was human error to not take the PSP charger with them. Do you think Logan going missing was something that Logan intentionally did? Or do you think that this was a 14 year old boy that just unfortunately was met with foul play in London? Let me know what you think. But that being said, that's a wrap on another spooky video.